Let's open up the mailbag, the Chris Stops Porzingis plan. Who leaves when this thing is about over? And a historical Celtics team with a twist right now on the Locked On Celtics podcast. Think the block was the bread. It's holiday season drop Drew in the mix. And three from KT, no, we not on the Knicks. Flush a competition like Al on Giannis. Juice and Big Zeus still being counts finest. Been a rate team going up in the rafters. Watch the seeds gain in locked on after. Corrales on the breakdown. Clutch like a tip from D. White on the breakdown. John on the mic document and domination. Matter pen of back day, it's all seeds nation. Rain and Jays, how we started raising business. How we finish locked on. Celtics pod, home of the winners. Hey there, welcome back to the Lockdown Celtics podcast. Right here on the Lockdown Podcast Network, we're to our team every day, and I got you covered Monday through Friday with a free, fresh podcast dropping directly to your device when you subscribe. It's Monday through Friday through July. It's Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but doesn't have to be. Could be a Tuesday or a Thursday on top of that, depending on how August goes. So maybe some extra with Team USA. Who knows? So Subscribe anyway, because it's more podcasting than you're going to find anywhere else. I'm John Corrales. Used to play a long time ago. Now I'm a beat writer covering the Celtics for Boston Sports Journal. I've also written the book Built Different, which you can find all across New England in bookstores and places like Walgreens and DJs and Sam's Club and also online. So go check that out. It's a mailbag day that's brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use the code LOCKDOWNNBA for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. That's for last-minute tickets. Later on, the historical Celtics, a couple of different twists on that. We'll talk about some of the chances for Celtics summer leaguers, Al Horford's legacy. But let's just start with the Chris Stops Porzingis plan. Questions from Dean and Owen. Dean asks, who do you think will step up to fill in for Porzingis minutes? Also, could we see Tatum start at the five when Al is not playing? Owen says, is this the season of Tatum at the five? He's our best rebounder. So it's going to be a a, a mix of everything, right? We're seeing Namiya Shkata step up a little bit here in the summer league. He'll, we've seen him have success at the NBA level. When, when Porzingis has been hurt, he'll get a chance. Obviously Luke Cornett is going to probably be the number one option get a bunch of those minutes. He had a slow start to last season, but picked it up and was was really good over the course of the regular season. So he'll be important. Uh, they, they will use Tatum at the five for sure. That's going to be a thing. But I think the you know they brought back Xavier Tillman. Switchability, if they want to go a little bit smaller, they could put Tillman and Tatum out there and that be uh, part of the kind of making up some of those those minutes. Tillman can sort of be the five. They they both will play down low in those situations. Horford will obviously start, but he's not going to start back to backs. And whenever that schedule comes out, we'll look at the November December back to backs because that's going to be important. The second night of those back to backs, who's going to start? It'll probably be Cornette, but depending on the matchups, Kata might get a shot. Tillman might get a shot. Tatum definitely, I think, will get some opportunities at the five against uh, fives that are not going to be like overly taxing on him. You still have to be careful about Tatum in certain situations because he's had a, a very busy summer, and you, you, I don't think you want to push him too hard early on, right? You, he's young, he's durable, and it makes perfect sense. At the same time. Don't go too crazy with it because I don't want to tempt fate. I don't want to push that that injury boundary too far, but it's going to be a mix of everybody as Porzingis ramps up and gets back. Next, Ty asks, uh, you know, the championship window for this team is going to be small. I want to get your thoughts on who you think should be the first domino to fall in the starting five. When that time comes, will it be Porzingis? What do you think the probability is of the Celtics retaining at least the Jays? And Vincent asks, how willing do you think the owners will be to keep the core six if we repeat next season? So two kind of questions here. Starting with Vincent, they're going to run it back again for one more season, I think. If the Celtics repeat, then... 
that'll mean a lot of money has come in. A title run is lucrative for the team winning because players are paid for the regular season. The contracts that they get are regular season contracts. The, the, the postseason is bonuses that I believe are paid by the league. So uh, postseason gate, uh, all the money that they come in, that comes in during a, a deep postseason run, that goes to the owners, and the owners kind of use can use some of that to pay the tax bill, the you know whatever else comes up. So a second championship run, yeah, run it back one more time. Let's see if he can do it one more time. That will be the most expensive team in NBA history. So I think it's just one run. But then after that, I don't think it's just Porzingis. It could be Holiday as well. In fact, I think Holiday is the most likely first domino uh, just because he's older and the Celtics, it, it might be easier to find a defensive-minded guy that can give you some of that. It's kind of hard to replace Porzingis, so you kind of want to keep him as long as you can. He's, he's still in his 20s. So if you can keep him, keep the unicorn, try to keep him healthy. It's it's a, a big drop off from holiday to the next guy, but it's it's easier to find a six three guard who can defend and hit some shots. And if you take a a, a mug like this big thing of water here and it's just water how much of this can you fill with talent to replace Porzingis how much of this can you fill with talent to replace Holiday I'll give you the little ice sound effect on the on the audio so you can hear it so I'm not just playing to the YouTube crowd this is like a 32 ounce cup by the way of the 32 ounces you could probably fill 20 to let's say 25 of talent to replace holiday. How much can you fill of that to replace Porzingis half? If you're lucky 16, can you get to 16 of what Porzingis does? That's difficult. So it, because of the position that he plays and the skill that he has. So specifically answering Vincent one more year, and then things start to go. And then to specifically answer Ty, I think the first one is going to be uh, Holiday. Porzingis probably next, depending, because he doesn't have a long shelf life considering the injury history. And the probability of retaining at least the Jays, they're under contract, so unless one of them asks for a trade, I think they're going to try to keep those guys as long as they can. Not saying asking for a trade is out of the question, because who knows what's going to happen in two years, three years. That's, don't know. At some point, the writing will be on the wall. At some point, there may have to be one of those guys that goes. Maybe if there if there's a, a particular player in a draft and the Celtics want to position themselves for a deep set of drafts, then maybe both of those guys go. Maybe, maybe there's a, a hard reset, but that's not, Till five, six years from now, these guys are in their mid twenties, but as the, as they turn 30 and they have a few years left of high level, a depending on where the Celtics are, that could be where you get the maximum trade value. And those guys do end up moving on. I expect them to move on at some point. Like, I don't want to make, I don't want to spend too much time now talking about that, but that's the reality. It's just shouldn't happen now. Shouldn't happen for a few years because the Celtics have a championship window that's open right now, at least for next year and the year after that. And then from there, you trust Brad Stevens to work his magic. Al Horford's legacy. Let's talk about that when we come back. Today's show is brought to you by Game Time. I know I'm going to try to find my way to some Red Sox games because it's that time of year. 
summertime. I'm having a you know a little less to do. I'm going to go down to one of the bars on Lansdowne Street. I'm going to open up the Game Time app. I'm going to have a drink and watch those prices fall as we get closer to the first pitch. Game Time's an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball. So those last minute tickets and killer last minute deals, all in prices. It's going to be very. It's going to be easier on the Game Time app. Those last minute deals can save you up to sixty percent. The flash deals are exclusive in app deals that can you can get on select seats ahead of your game or event because it's not just sports; it's comedy, concerts, theater, all of that stuff. Zone deals where you pick the section and they'll pick the seats. You can save a little bit more money there. Toggle all in pricing so you can get exactly what you're paying up front. No surprise fees at checkout, and your seat views will give you a view from the uh, panoramic view so you know what you're getting into. The lowest price guarantee credits you 110% of the difference. So if you find that ticket somewhere else for less, take the guesswork out of buying Major League Baseball tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use the code Locked On NBA for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create the account, a co- a redeem the code Locked On L O C K E D Locked On NBA for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Thanks for making Locked On Celtics your first listen every day. Make your second listen, Locked On NBA, which I just recorded with Jake Madison of Locked On Pelicans. We're talking about James Dolan's uh, anger about the TV deal. We're talking about the Clippers. Kind of confusing statements on Kawhi Leonard. And Jalen Brown's comments, not public, private comments, but he mouthed the words about Bronny James not being a pro. We talked about all that stuff. So go check that out. Let's get back to the mailbag questions about Al Horford and his legacy. Zach asks if Horford plays next season and does another year contract, like you've talked about being a possibility, he'd be one season shy of matching his time with Atlanta. He had better statistical season with the Hawks, but more success with Boston. How will he be ultimately remembered? Well, (coughs) excuse me. He'll be, it, it, it depends. I think he's one of those rare guys. I think you can remember him as both. People will tend to always remember a, a player for his most recent team. Uh, but, you know, KG will always be remembered in Minnesota. And that's a different story. It was a little bit, he was, he was in Boston less time than he was in Minnesota. Horford in Atlanta did play like half of his career there. And and did have some success. And those teams were kind of surprisingly good. I, I think I think people will remember those days, but championship, a championship season in Boston, maybe two championship seasons, that's that I think where most of the people will remember. And and but because he was so good as a hawk. I do, I do think that that's going to be a big part of his story. And so I don't think it'll be forgotten. But winning a championship supersedes everything. So it'll be Boston first, Atlanta second. But Atlanta will be a big part of, of that. And that brings me to Bronson's question about, is there any bad blood between Al and Paul Pierce? I remember the 2008 playoff series between Boston and Atlanta when Pierce and him got into it. I've never seen them in photos or mentioned each other. Well, the only time I've actually heard I can think of where Al mentioned Paul Pierce is saying that he bet Paul Pierce ten thousand dollars that because Pierce said they were going to sweep, and Al Horford said I'll bet you ten grand that you don't, and they didn't. Uh, obviously, that went seven games, and Pierce never paid up. I wouldn't say there's bad blood, but Pierce and and Horford definitely got into it. That whole gang sign thing. If people remember Pierce was flashing some hand gestures at, I think it was at Al Horford. Like that was part of this whole thing. Uh, so that was a, that was a dumb controversy, but yeah, I do think that there might be some history between those guys that makes you say, maybe they're not the best of friends. I don't know if it's bad blood per se, but it's not exactly 
let's meet up for dinner and talk about old times. Andrew asks, will the Celtics wings get rested enough this season to give any of the summer league three and D guys a chance to crack the rotation? This is a good question because the short turnaround and frankly, a lot of the celebrating that's happening over the summer, you wonder how that's going to impact guys. And uh, Jalen Brown talked about it at summer league where he said the, uh, the, the snub from team USA is, is giving him some motivation. He's already talked to some of the guys about when they're getting back in the gym. It, it it's going to be interesting to see how much that fuels him and, and how, how ready these guys are going to be right away. Day one, this is going to be a challenge. So. I think, and this is going to be a challenge, by the way, for Joe Missoula, because you can't just come in and give those guys 37, 38 minutes right away. A little bit of a shorter turnaround. Got to rely on your depth. Got to maybe manage the minutes a little bit differently. I'd be very curious to see how Joe does that. Will the ring, the, the wings get rested enough? They should. And that should open up some opportunities. I don't know how much it's going to be Jaden Springer or Jordan Walsh or any of those guys, Baylor Shireman. I wouldn't call him a three and D guy necessarily, but he's got the three part down. Springer might have a chance. Springer might have a chance to get some, uh, get some run because he's NBA level defender, high level defender. and if his jumper really is kind of where it needs to be, then they can trust him to put it to, you know, trust him to hit some shots. You can put him out there. You know, he's going to defend, And if he's going to score a couple of, couple of buckets for you, then that will be helpful. So I guess the way to phrase that question, it's, or answer that question is with a question, will any of the summer three and D guys be good enough from three to allow the Celtics wings to get rested this season. If they are, if Springer, if Walsh, if, you know, Shireman are good enough again, Shireman, it's, it is the defense, but Springer specifically, especially if he's good enough from three, then that will allow Missoula to rest Tatum for a little bit longer. You know, when he comes out, uh, you, you rest them a little bit longer. Maybe you don't bring them back at the end of the first quarter. Maybe you rest them the whole, you know, through the first quarter, you, you bring them out at like the six or seven starts the second quarter. Maybe that's the way to do it, but only if those guys have proved that they're ready. Let's get an NBA question here which NBA questions are welcome, by the way. Uh, any question is welcome. And you'll find I saved the third segment for some more fun questions. Any, All these questions are, are welcome. By the way, questions are submitted at johncorrales.com slash mailbag. I keep forgetting to put that up. johncorrales.com slash mailbag, just like I keep forgetting to put the championship belt up there. Even though I went into this thing this season, the, before this, this podcast, I said, remember to put the belt up. I get to talking and it's, I don't have a producer. Anyway, Jack says, Hey John, how do you feel about KCP leaving the nuggets on a scale of one to 10? How much worse did they get? Hard to put the scale there, but they, it's hard. It, it depends on like Christian Brown. They're, they're kind of relying on him to fill some of that gap. If he does fill that gap, then it doesn't hurt them as much, but it definitely hurts them. It's not a 10, but it's not a one. So what's that? A five, four. It hurts because he's a reliable three point shooter and he's a good defender. And he's somebody that you can trust to defend on the perimeter. And with Jokic back there, it's, you don't want him covering for, for too many guys defensively because he's not able to do that as well. And nickel and diming now with Jokic in his prime, I think that's a bad idea. I just don't like what the Nuggets did. It might not hurt them. 
Jokic might be good enough to make up the difference, but I don't think this is going to go well for Denver. Jokic is good, but it is a step back. If Brown can step up and make up for that, then great. But that's still a one, one less depth piece. Like Brown can step up, but who steps up for him? That's that's where I question what Denver is doing. So th- there'll be a team to watch in in the preseason for sure, uh, in the regular season, early regular season, because if if you if you keep doing this, then I don't know if if that's exactly what Jokic is going to be looking for from a team. Just something to keep an eye on. All right, we'll get some more fun questions, including historical questions. A An all-time team with a strange twist. Not that strange, but it's a twist, and it's next. Let's get back to this mailbag. Let's finish it off. Johnny L. says... Do you have any regrets hosting the book event for Kendrick Perkins now that he's morphed into a Celtics hater? Would you still host the event if he called you today, considering how disliked he is by fans? Perk is doing a bit. He's out there. He says what he needs to say to make money. He's out there just putting on whatever show he's putting on. So I have no regrets about hosting his book event. Um, I enjoyed hosting his book event. Yes, I would do it again because it still still was good for me, um, and good for me to you know get out there. And Perk is a you know a personality that people pay attention to, and it was good. I mean, Bob Ryan was in the front row of that event. Bob Ryan is one of the all-time greats when it comes to uh, writing journalist in Boston. And thankfully, he paid me a nice compliment on Twitter after the event. So you better believe I would host that event again because I did something. I was on a stage. Bob Ryan was in the audience, and he liked it. So, yeah. Yeah, that means that's one of one of my career highlights that Bob Ryan said I did a good job doing that. That's I mean, that's like being a basketball player and like taps you on the shoulder. He's like, good game, son. I'd be like, ah, ah oh my God. And that was my reaction. When Bob Ryan tweeted that, I was like, oh my God. I was like, whew, this is this is a moment for me. So yeah. Of course. Andrew F. Said last year, the Celtics came out with the top 15 all time. It felt like 14 players were locks. 15th was up for grabs. Uh, I was eagerly anticipating a championship so we could add Tatum and have a clear 15. But then Jalen went and screwed things up. So who gets kicked off? Uh, so the 15, 15 players, which I was a voter on this, uh, for this thing that that came out a couple of seasons ago, Ray Allen, Larry Bird, Bob Cousy, Dave Collins, Kevin Garnett, John Havlicek, Tommy Heinsohn, Dennis Johnson, Sam Jones, Kevin McHale, Robert Parrish, Paul Pierce, Bill Russell, Bill Sharman, and Jojo White in alphabetical order. If you're going to add Tatum, who I'm still, you know, I don't like doing that mid career. He's the, he will be there. Jalen will probably be there, but not putting them there yet. But who comes off the list first? I, I'm i leaning towards Sharman, who is there as a nod to the 1950s. And I'm going to mention Sharman again in a, in a minute here with the last questions, last question of the mailbag. But I think... Of those names, Charmin might be the first, just because in 1950, there were like eight teams or something. It was not 
it was not a, a the best league in the world at that point. Well, it probably was the best league in the world because the only league in the world, really. Uh, but the, it was not an integrated league, and so some of the best players were playing in you know bar, on barnstorming teams that weren't part necessarily of a league. Uh, the Harlem Globetrotters were created for black players. It's become just the entertainment show now, but it was back then the Harlem Globetrotters would play NBA teams in exhibition games for black players that couldn't play in the league, uh, just to kind of showcase their talents. Um, so I'm leaning Charmin just because of the era, even though you want to make sure that guys of the past were honored, but that's what Koozie is there for. Um, Sam Jones, those guys. Uh, next on that list, pains me to say it might be Dennis Johnson just because of the longevity. And he wasn't around for all that long. So those are the first two names that I would knock off. And if you want to put Tatum and Brown on there, if you want to do it now, you can do it now. I like to wait till the end of careers just because um, this is an all-time thing. So let them play their careers out and they'll, they'll make the team eventually. Finally, <laughs> a group of aliens has invaded and wants to play a game of basketball. You have to pick an all time Celtics team with this stipulation. It's eight players and you must select one Celtics player from each decade. 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 20s, 2000s, 2010s, 2020s. Starting five has to be a traditional lineup. Point guard, shooting guard, small forward, power forward, and center. Three bench players are wild cards of your choosing. So this is this is a tough question because once I pick somebody from an era from the 70s, that eliminates all the other players that are in the 70s. So do I pick someone who spans a, a decade? Uh, how do I, how do I, um, how do I put this team together? Uh, and let me see, I forgot, damn, I want to give credit to the person who asked me this question. Um, but I don't, I can't find it. I'm sorry. I cut off the name and sorry. Uh, but okay. So my traditional Starting five, center, power forward, small forward, shooting guard, point guard. Starting with the center because it's obvious. It's Bill Russell. That eliminates the 60s. So Bob Cousy's not on this team. Sam Jones is not on this team. That hurts me. That hurts my feelings. But I got to pick Bill Russell at the as the 60s representative. KG is my power forward because I picked Larry Bird as my small forward. Larry Bird is my small forward. It represents the 80s. So Parrish, DJ, McHale, my hero, they're all gone. I can't pick McHale because I got to pick Bird as my small forward. So now KG is my 2000s representative because I need a power forward. That eliminates Paul Pierce from this team because I needed the, the Paul Pierce of the 2000s. I'm not going to go back into the 90s. I wanted 2000s Paul Pierce. These guys are, uh, you. the player you pick is as they were during that decade. So I'm not picking KG, prime KG, I'm picking KG from the Celtics, who was a defensive player of the year. So, Russell, KG, Bird. What a front line, right? So, even though I've eliminated a lot of guys, that's a front line. My shooting guard, actually, I'm going to go to, to point guard. I'm going to go to point guard because it's JoJo White. And he's from the 70s. The 70s eliminates uh, Havlicek. It eliminates Dave Cowens from consideration. 
So a lot of names that I would put on an all-time Celtics team are out. That leaves me with very little choices. And why I couldn't pick Paul Pierce for this team because I need a shooting guard. I could have finagled Pierce as a shooting guard in there, but I'm going Reggie Lewis. 90s Reggie Lewis, who people forget he was a problem. Reggie Lewis as my starting shooting guard representing the 90s. So now I've got 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s represented in my starting five. Again, JoJo White, Reggie Lewis, Larry Bird, Kevin Garnett, Bill Russell. I got three bench players. I need somebody from the 50s, from the 2010s, and the 2020s. The 50s, I've mentioned them. It's Bill Sharman. Bill Sharman had a hell of a career. He, he was multiple-time first-team All-NBA. He was the star of that era. So he's my 50s guy. 2010, easy choice. Isaiah Thomas, who had those, those two seasons that he had for the Celtics. Th those were two of the best seasons in Celtics history. Think about that scoring punch off the bench. And with all this defense that I've put out there, it's there's so much defense on this team. And still, scoring. Bird can score. KG can score. Reggie Lewis can score. JoJo White facilitating. He could score. And from the 2020s, it's Jason Tatum. Tatum, versatility, gives you that rebounding. Um, I picked him over Jalen because of that versatility. Um, still a good defender, but also a good facilitator and a, a really good rebounder. And you can put him out there across three positions. He could sub in for Bird. He could sub in for KG. He could sub in for Bill Russell. He could sub in for Reggie Lewis if he wanted to. So. That versatility brings Tatum. So Tatum, Isaiah, Bill Sharman on the bench, JoJo White, Reggie Lewis, Larry Bird, Kevin Garnett, and Bill Russell, my one player from each decade with the traditional starting lineups. That's my team. Uh, tell me what your team would be. Get into the, the, the comment section there. Thanks for the questions. I appreciate that. And uh, would love it if you uh, subscribed. If you haven't subscribed yet, Again, get into the comment section on YouTube, subscribe on YouTube, ring the bell, share the podcast, tell everybody on watching the Lockdown Celtics podcast here on the Lockdown Podcast Network. It's your team every day.